Here's Greg Kukul to make excuses for God creating evil. All right, this one comes from Jeremy. Does God still create calamity today in the, conste- in the context of Isaiah 45, 7? Um, sure. Uh, I have no reason to think that that's not the case because God uses certain means to certain ends. Now, th- that particular passage, uh, unfortunately, is translated differently in different translations, and sometimes it says God creates evil. Why is that unfortunate? Do you not agree with that translation? The word in the original Hebrew is ra, which more generically means badness. Now, why would a perfectly good and all-loving God create badness? This seems like a contradiction to me. But the New American Standard says calamity, and I think that's the point. When you read the larger context, it's the calamity that God brings in judgment on others that subjectively they understand as evil to them. Well, apparently it's evil to God, too, because in that passage, God is speaking in the first person and saying that he creates badness. This wasn't written from the perspective of the reprobate. It was written from the perspective of God. God sees some of what he does as evil. But it's not morally evil. It's only Mm -hmm. as evil as uh, an electric chair is to a a criminal who's being executed. But again, this passage wasn't written from the perspective of the criminal. It was written from the perspective of the executioner. Apologists love to use the word calamity to soften the passage, but I don't see how that's really any better. If a perfectly just judge is doling out a just punishment, that judge wouldn't call what he's doing a calamity either. Oh, that thing's bad, yeah. Well, or those that go to hell. Hell is bad subjectively to them because of what they experience, but it's morally good place. And, uh, and when God brings the kind of calamity <clears throat> that's described in this passage, he is, he is bringing appropriate judgment on people. In what other context is an appropriate judgment called a calamity, let alone the evil? If this means just judgment, why didn't the passage just say judgment or punishment? This is yet another example of the supposedly perfect word of God apparently being written by someone with the communication skills of salmon-flavored cheese custard. And on nations. Now, I have no reason to believe that this was like Old Testament, now New Testament, that doesn't happen. Because obviously the book of Revelation uh, identifies events that are still future, and those entail God bringing that kind of calamity on nations, on whole massive groups of people. Seems kind of problematic to judge an entire ethnic group as collectively guilty, don't you think? Romans 1, giving people over to their... There would be an individual example, you know, he gave them over, he gave them over. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be a group of people, it could be individual people, whatever, he gives them over. So we have those those examples in the New Testament. Well, God's not really giving people over to sin if he's punishing them for it later. You'd think giving people over to their desires would mean allowing them to indulge in them. But if you're punishing them for it later, that's not really allowing it, is it? And I, I think it's sometimes a mistake to say, oh, that tragedy, that that uh, hurricane over New Orleans, that was God's judgment upon the sin of New Orleans, you know. Why? Does God not control the weather? Perhaps you might say that he sent the hurricane for some benevolent end rather than as punishment, but does this all-powerful being not have the power to accomplish his ends without sending hurricanes? And uh, the, all the, uh, the French Quarter, etc., the irony about that claim is that the French Quarter was actually spared because it was high ground. It was the low ground that got destroyed. Gee, it's almost like it was a natural phenomenon that doesn't give a shit how many beaded necklaces you get at Mardi Gras. Um, And so I think it's a mistake to try to, or let me put it this way, it's hazardous to try to look at any natural disaster and say, this is the hand of judgment of God upon these Mm -hmm. people. Um, Well, if you believe that God is behind everything, it's still God creating that calamity, is it not? Even if it's not for the purpose of punishment, you believe that he's creating that calamity for some purpose. If it's a benevolent purpose, why doesn't this all-powerful God have the power to achieve his benevolent purpose without malevolent means? Characteristically in scriptures, those judgments were heralded. People were told in advance that these judgments were coming. And this was the point of Jonah going to uh, Nineveh to declare the judgment of God that was going to come. And this is the Hebrew prophets declaring the judgment of God that was going to come. So characteristically, the message of judgment is, uh, is, is there's a herald to that before judgment descends. And I don't see any legitimate uh, or, or uh, say, 
believable, bona fide, whatever examples of that in, in cultures today. True prophets rising up and saying, oh, God, uh, there are people who have risen up and called judgment on America, and this is going to happen to this date, and just... I just ignore those because the date passes and nothing happens, you know. The prophets who say some disaster is going to happen on such and such a date will find some mudslide or tornado somewhere and cite it as fulfillment of prophecy. Similarly, the authors of the New Testament will find or sometimes just make up some event that they think fulfills Old Testament prophecy. And one just passed recently. I'm not sure which date that was, but something was supposed to happen and uh, in some significant date, and uh, there were Christians who were making claims about that, but nothing, of course, took place. So I think it's hazardous to identify any particular thing as the judgment of God. Um, however, I have no reason to believe that God has stopped doing that, and he certainly will, it seems, in the future do that, Book of Revelation. So... Um, well, you know, that's still an open possibility. One reason why we can't declare this is a judgment on so and so is because sometimes calamities come not for the sake of judgment. And Job is a perfect example of that. God brought calamity on Job, not for the sake of judgment, but for, uh, for other reasons. The other reason was to win a bet with Satan. Satan said that Job is only so pious because he has a good life. And God said, nuh-uh, and let Satan torment him to prove that he would remain pious. You know, mm -hmm. he, was, he was revealing Job's love for God, revealing that his love didn't depend on what God was giving him. Mm -hmm. uh, Which is a goal worthy of unaliving Job's children, I guess. So he was bringing glory to himself through Job, uh, through this calamity. He was bringing glory to himself by allowing Satan to do what he did to Job's children? What does glory even mean to you if you think that's something glorious? So, um, I, I don't think... We, in fact, actually, there was a verse I saw I just yesterday. I was reading in Job, and I, I wrote it down here because it kind of speaks to this. He's talking about um, here, here's what it says. Also with moisture, he loads the thick cloud. He disperses the cloud of his lightning. It changes direction, turning around by his guidance that it may do whatever he commands on the face of the inhabited earth, whether for correction or for his world or for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. Mm -hmm. So here we've got a storm. Sometimes it's for correction. Sometimes it's for his world. Sometimes it's for his loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Which one of those was unaliving Job's children? And we can't always tell what God is doing in any one situation. But the point that Isaiah is making is that he's sovereign over it all. Right. And that's why he uses these opposites. He says um, light and darkness, well-being and calamity. Job in this case, right? No, this it, oh. in the, t the, t the text of Isaiah 45. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. He talks about how um, he... he creates or he gives oh, he's creator of light and darkness verse, right, calamity right, right, and right. so he's basically giving these opposites to show that god is sovereign over everything mm -hmm. and thus bears responsibility for everything for example he didn't have to put that tree in the garden in the first place i've heard some apologists hypothesize that god put the tree in the garden to deliberately set adam and eve up so that he can be glorified and dying for humanity's sins later on that doesn't sound very glorious to me that sounds pretty vain and job's just an example where another text that makes the same point. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, yes, God does still create calamity today. See, and he could use the calamity for judgment. He could use it to accomplish a different good exactly. in people's lives. Right? Exactly. Does this all-powerful God not have the power to accomplish these goods without calamity? To everyone who helps me out on Patreon, you're a big help. Thanks so much.